My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I am a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This is a college lecture on architecture design theory, part six, proportion and scale. This is a seven part series with files available in PowerPoint, uh, MP4, uh, uploaded to YouTube and PDF. If you are on YouTube, there'll be a PDF file link in the comments. If you are an MP4 and you want to get to something that has links, then change the file extension in your URL to PDF from MP4. My sources are personal architectural projects, I have a dozen small residential projects, as well as being involved in large commercial projects, office parks for high-tech companies in Texas and California. Uh, frequent international travel, I've taught in Italy, have a relationship with six universities in Italy, also other places around Europe and, and Japan and uh, Central and South America. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science Architectural Engineering, University of Texas, 1984. And then after working a while, I went back to school for another year and a half in urban design, as well as later going on and getting master's and PhD in electrical computer engineering, which is not as relevant to this lecture series. And then the main books here, we have a book on architecture theory and one of Frank Wood Wright books uh, in his own words, which I like to use, and other sources on Frank Lloyd Wright and other, uh, other sources for architecture theory. I'm writing a book on Frank Lloyd Wright. Scale is size compared to a reference. We have mechanical scale, which would be our architect scale and our engineering scale. And this is size of proportion to some standard, an accepted standard of measurement. Visual scale is a perception, the size or proportion an element appears to have relative to other elements of a known or assumed size. This is our architect scale. And we read it from either left to right or right to left, depending on which scale. You can see the scales here. Here's an eighth inch equals a foot, we read it this way. A quarter inch equals a foot, we read it this way. This is a tutorial for using an architect scale video. You can get to the link in the PDF form in the comments of the YouTube video. Uh, you see here a measurement of 13 foot 6 inches on a quarter inch scale. It says under the pencil there, quarter inch equals a foot scale. And you put the line here on the scale on the edge of this wall to get this measurement. And then what's left over over here is the inches. So you see counting from right to left, uh, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13. That's 13. And then the six inches is this part here with a fine gradation of inches. And there's 12 of them there. And we're right in the middle at six inches. So 13 feet, six inches. Here are two scales that I often ask the students to purchase in my architecture courses and beginning architecture courses. And it's not only the architect scale, but also the engineer's scale. You have an architect scale and an engineer's scale, and you read the architect scale. Uh, like, for example, here, the quarter inch equals a foot here. We're reading this way or an eighth inch equals a foot. We're reading this way. And we already mentioned previous slide about how the feet and inches work out there. On the engineer scale, uh, they have this number 40 or 50 or 60, and that means one inch equals 50 feet scale, uh, often used on the maps in civil engineering, uh, excavation kind of drawings, site drawings. In this example, you see using the engineering scale, and this is a site plan, a development plan of streets and lots, where the scale is one inch equals 200 feet. 
but the engineering scale only has 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 on it. And so this case, we want to use the 20 and then adjust because it's actually one. So there's 200, so multiply everything by 10. So you see here, we're showing that in this video. So take a look at that video. Get into the link somehow. Go into the PDF comments of the YouTube. Or if you're in PDF and a PowerPoint, you just click right on the link. Visual scale refers not to actual dimensions, but to how small or large something appears in relation to its normal size or to the size of other things. We speak of urban scale when a project is in the context of a city or neighborhood scale when a building is appropriate to its locale or street scale for relative sizes of elements fronting a roadway. At a scale of a building, we perceive size of each element in relation to other parts or to the whole. Human scale is based on a human body. We gauge a space whose width we can reach out and touch its walls. We judge its height if we can reach up and touch the ceiling. Once we can no longer do these things, we rely on visual clues to give us a sense of scale. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's dining room, his home and studio in Oak Park, Illinois, outside of Chicago. For these clues, we use elements whose dimensions are related to dimensions of our pace, reach, or grasp. Table or chair, the risers and treads of a stairway, or the sill of a window, not only help us judge the size of a space, but also give it a human scale. In a room that is intimate in scale, you feel comfortable, in control, or important. However, a structure or urban space that is monumental in scale makes us feel small. Proportion is the harmonious relation in magnitude, quantity, or degree of one part to another or to the whole. Regulating lines parallel or perpendicular, control the proportion and placement of elements. There's regulating lines in the Pantheon, in Rome, through the oculus, the hole in the roof, where the sun can come in. And a picture I believe I took in 2011 at nighttime. Looking at a section of the Pantheon, seeing the regulating lines, also in plan view, another section, seeing that a sphere was um, enclosed within the building. The volume of the design was designed as if there's a, sp a sphere within, so you see radiating lines coming out of the center of the sphere in the section view, as well as in this plan view. A form can appear to be long, short, stubby, or squat, based on how we perceive its proportions. A rectangle can appear square, almost a square, or very much unlike a square. While a composition of similar proportioned elements may have a natural unity, a composition of dissimilar proportions can still be organized in a uniform manner, utilizing ordered principles such as datum or rhythm, which we'll see more of in part seven principles. The proportional emphasis of a composition can be primarily horizontal,
Now, much of Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie style emphasized the horizontal, as well as some of his other works. Uh, he said, quote, uh, I extended horizontal spacing without enlarging the building by cutting out all the room partitions that did not serve the kitchen or give needed privacy, freedom of floor space and elimination of useless heights, a sense of repose in flat planes and quiet streamline effects. Now, his prairie style expanded on his organic architecture, planes close to the earth identifying with the ground, complementing wide open plains of Midwest. Uh, his horizontal also was emphasized by low ceiling and banding of windows, um, walls above window bands painted the same color as the ceiling, bands of interior horizontal trim work, uh, extending roof overhangs, uh, long cantilever balconies, uh, exterior facades of horizontal board and batten. We'll see that in the picture coming up here in Roman brick. We'll see that also with folded plane like origami continuity, wall ceiling and floors becoming one in the pinwheel planes, uh, emphasizing the horizontal in all of this. So you can see in his prairie style, the horizontal, the extended cantilevers out here and uh, overhangs and uh, long horizontal elements, banding of windows, flat roofs. Again, in the prairie style, extending cantilevers out and banding of windows, horizontal. And you can see in my video log on YouTube channel of uh, 31 Frank Lloyd Wright sites that I've visited and uh, filed documentations, several books, uh, AIA Guide to Chicago, as well as a catalog by store of all Frank Lloyd Wright's works. And I narrate as I tour these places. More prairie style, more horizontal. The way these walls jet out and band around the house, as well as the other elements we've mentioned. And uh, there are a number of designs of Frank Lloyd Wright that are cited as being the original uh, from different sources that I found. Uh, although he actually would say that uh, uh, this house down here, the 19. 1894 Winslow residence was his first prairie style. And you see some of the elements in it, but it's not the mature prairie style that you would see in other buildings with all of the known elements that we've talked about. You can even see the emphasis in the horizontal on this three-story building, uh, the William Frick House in Oak Park, Illinois, outside of Chicago with the way these walls extend out even further to the right over here and the cantilevers and the low pitched roofs, as well as the banding of windows. Here's another one, the Isabella Roberts residence. This was designed by a female architect that had worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, this one had a tree growing up through it. Now it's over a hundred years old, so the tree grew quite a bit and got cut and looked like recently when I took this picture. Had a big knot on the side, a pretty thick window. Uh, and you see the horizontal here, the, you can see it. And of course, Roby House uh, is one of his most famous designs. This is not in Oak Park, this is in, uh, on the University of Chicago campus, south part of Chicago. Certainly can see the strong horizontal emphasis as well as the Roman brick we'll talk about here in a second. More on the Roby house in the prairie style, horizontal. Some other ways that he implemented his horizontal design philosophy. Uh, was with this board and batten. Board and batten is where you have planks of wood and you put them side by side and then you uh, cover the cracks with uh, thin strips of wood, one by threes, one by twos. This is typically done vertically. Uh, and it was traditional on, on barns, and many outbuildings. 
these times, uh, there weren't sheet goods back then. So it was common to side the building with uh, wood planks and then cover the seams. But again, he did it in a horizontal way here. He also uh, designed and specified brick to be laid out in a horizontal way. So it simulated board and batten horizontal, the way he recessed and protruded different brick courses. And here's the Roman brick again, and a very thin, thin brick, uh, difficult to install. I know I've heard the story of this. This is my wife's father. Uh, laid these bricks in the 1950s of this chimney when he built this house with his father outside of Chicago. Uh, so a lot of influence, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright influence on, on the horizontal in and around Chicago that lived long after his, uh, his, his lifetime when he died in 1959, influenced people to this day. The proportional emphasis of a composition can be primarily vertical in architecture as well as in urban design so the proportional emphasis can be primarily vertical in the cityscapes and the urban design uh, this is austin texas uh, recent picture there were quite a few buildings there when i lived there in the 1980s not as many as are here but it still had a vertical emphasis in the downtown Also, downtown San Diego uh, worked there and lived in San Diego, uh, several places in San Diego County, along with the downtown a little bit. I didn't live in the downtown, worked there a little bit. Also, San Francisco, I uh, lived there for two years uh, in the city and uh, you see the buildings, not Quite a view like this, but uh, spectacular views where we were also. We lived in uh, Presidio Heights, which would be, you can't see it's over to the right here out of this picture, <laughs> but we could look out from the top of the hill and see Golden Gate Bridge. This picture is taken from Marin County looking back towards the city of the bay. And the Golden Gate Bridge is in the foreground. Proportional constraints on form by materials or structure control proportion or forms and spaces to make a room square or oblong, intimate or lofty in scale, or imposing with higher than normal facade. Is there a point at which the overhead plane becomes visually too much for the, its supporting visual mass? Or a point at which the supporting visual structure becomes too light to support the overhead plane? At what point does this array of trellising appear to be properly spaced? golden section in proportion, golden ratio. Been used since Egyptian times. Parthenon, Greece. Classical orders, different columns, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, composite. Other classical orders, floor plans, temples, columns layout.
So we saw that in Western civilization, portion and scale in uh, classical Roman and Greek times, as well as Egyptian before that, and then into the Renaissance now, in the 1500s, uh, Andrea Palladio, uh, some of the most influential uh, in the Italian Renaissance uh, floor plans and proportions in his four books on architecture, published in Venice in 1570. You can see the proportions of the spaces. During the Renaissance, Palladio also proposed several methods for determining the height of rooms and ideal proportions. Le Corbusier in France also had a proportional system he called modulor and had a whole system of ordering and proportion of dimensions to humans in spaces. Let's see more of this here, Le Corbusier, building section. Modulor. Here's a famous example of Le Corbusier's uh, modulor. And uh, this type of building that, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, got uh, proliferated throughout the world as uh, inner city housing projects in America and uh, Soviet uh, mass housing uh, and somewhat sterile if you've walked through these kind of complexes. And it can be it, it can be something else. I've seen it in some places in actually in Austria and uh, right on the border of Hungary across the river from uh, Budapest where this is uh, uh, the people put plants every every one of these balconies has plants and then there's a big common area down on the ground wooded and connected with a, a shopping mall and supermarket and cafes and it's it is a real community in an ideal sense but uh, I think for the most part most of the buildings I've seen around the world especially in American cities um, have not implemented this uh, in an ideal way And here's a planned city concept by Le Corbusier, uh, as you can see, a modular type of concept. Again, this lends itself to uh, mass housing in uh, not the best way, in my opinion, where I've seen versions of this implemented. Not exactly this, but something like this. It needs to really be dampened with quite a bit on the ground and landscaping in common areas. <clears throat> Otherwise, you're just warehousing people, in my opinion. The Japanese originally had a traditional unit of measure, the shaku, uh, imported from China. And then it had another unit of measure, the ken, which is a little bit different. Uh, the ken uh, was not only a measurement for the construction of buildings, it evolved into an aesthetic module that ordered the structure, materials, and space of Japanese architecture. The tokonomo is a special space in Japanese houses. It's a spiritual center. It's where they put flowers. Uh, it's slightly raised up off the floor, and it's set back into a little space off of a formal room you see here in the floor plan as well as the interior elevation a very important element of japanese ken design and the modularity of it is the standard mat it's a tatami floor mat um, with this certain specific dimensions and then all the floor spaces are made up of multiples of that, that tatami.
In a typical Japanese house, the Ken grid orders the structure as well as the additive space-to-space -space sequence of rooms. The relatively small uh, unit module, the, the tatami, allows the rectangular spaces to be freely arranged in linear, staggered, or clustered patterns. Here's a couple elevations of a typical Japanese residence. And you can see in this slide that the Japanese Ken modular design is not just the dimensions of the tatami mats, the unit modular mats, but it does extend up in its influence over the walls and elements in the vertical as well. You can see here in these vertical elements, the influence by the standardized dimensions of the tatami mat of the Japanese Ken system. On this slide, you can not only see how the tatami unit of the Ken, Japanese Ken system, modular system, defines the shape of these rooms in plan, but also how it affects all the vertical elements. Modularity can also be found in Frank Lloyd Wright's textile houses in the Los Angeles and California, there are several of them out there. And he was somewhat innovative in how he put these blocks together. They were cast in concrete and added a form of uh, reinforcing steel as a mesh. Here's the interior of this uh, Frank Lloyd Wright textile house and modularity, carrying the same materials from outside to in and inside to out. He's known for that. Uh, and this particular building is, has been in several movies, I believe, Blade Runner. Um, and these spaces, they're not uh, uh, what you would typically think of a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's works. In a certain period of his life, he was being inspired by uh, Mayan ruins, uh, having to do with uh, certain period of personal things that he was dealing with. So in my lecture series on Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, you can hear more about this. And again, I'm writing a book about Frank Lloyd Wright, but uh, there's a time in his life where he, uh, he, had, he had a wife and children and six, six children who left them with a mistress and went and lived in Europe and then she came back and she she was murdered and he was uh, in trauma from that shock and trauma and it, it affected his designs so you see uh, these Mayan uh, pre-Columbian type architecture on California's textile houses and they're tomb-like and reminiscent of Mayan burial rituals human sacrifice so he's arguably still feeling the trauma of the murder of his mistress Here's another example of another textile house in Los Angeles, the Millard House. And another one, the John Storer House, also in Los Angeles, another textile house. Another textile house, the Samuel Freeman House, in Los Angeles. Now, regardless of the inspiration of why these houses uh, looked like they did. He innovated uh, with these materials, uh, cast concrete shapes and unit sizes uh, with Mayan, Mayan patterns, 
and woven together with steel reinforcing bars. So pretty innovative for the time. And you can read more about that in uh, this resource here. And you can see more on uh, modular uh, structural art, as Frank Lloyd Wright would call his textile blocks, uh, in a concrete masonry unit, which is not quite architectural, or it can be. Uh, and, you, and this is uh, from a lecture in my materials and methods course. And you can see the uh, PDF here in the PPTX audio, if you link to that, um, made 450 concrete block for this edition. Of, buildings my son helping out and carved his name in the cornerstone down here and then this is uh, in europe a different kind of uh, a cmu very lightweight um i haven't seen this in the united states but this was in uh, mons belgium where my uncle had lived for 40 years passed away not too long ago anthropometry or anthropomorphizing refers to the measurement of the size and proportion of the human body. Uh, architects in the Renaissance saw proportion uh, and the human figure as a reaffirmation that certain mathematical ratios reflected the harmony of their universe. Anthropomorphic proportioning methods seek not abstract or symbolic ratios, but functional ones. They are predicated on the theory that forms and spaces in architecture are either containers or extensions of the human body and should therefore be determined by its dimensions. Example of anthropomorphism is this entesis, the curves on the columns, uh, Greek and Roman, uh, to uh, animate the inanimate with uh, human-like form. So again, I've been ending my lecture series, lectures with uh, reference to this organic architectural design principles. I'm writing a book on Frank Led Wright, and this is a synthesis of a lot of research I've done. Uh, but I want to put this just in the context of what we're talking about here. And so, uh, you know, the, the geometries and the human scale, of course, and, and the conforming to the site relate to what we spoke about here. And form and function and uh, the harmony of, uh, of elements, uh, not one following the other but working together in a unified whole. And the structural art that we spoke of here with the modular design. And you can read more on Frank Lloyd Wright in many details, over 10 hours, 10 to 20 hours, if you do all the activities in my lecture series on Frank Lloyd Wright. And again, I'm writing a book on Frank Lloyd Wright coming up um, in a couple of years, going on sabbatical in spring of 2023, uh, with the intent of getting that book published, as well as developing a, a course uh, in high tech and computer game design and virtual reality. And again, links to the other parts of this lecture series, PPTX MP4, YouTube, and PDF.